out there. Jet, when you're ready. Oh, man. <sighs> Is this my seat? This may be worse. Oh, uh, yeah, it's good. Whatever. How athletes need to train conditioning. Let's go. Dude, we were... There was an issue, a little buggy bug with the OBS that we use. Um, so we had some some problems setting that up. And I somebody said I was going to be 2,024 minutes late for the first live. Welcome to the first live of 2024. What a freaking fantastic time. And dude, I know this might sound grumpy, but sometimes I can't stand the holidays because you're in such a good rhythm. You got everything rolling and you're like making good headway. And then all of a sudden it's just two weeks of total cluster mayhem. So <clears throat> I think it's uh, obviously it's great to spend time with your family. I was fortunate enough. I went down to, I was at uh, the Duke's mayonnaise bowl, the mayonnaise bowl in uh, Charlotte. I got to see West Virginia play uh, North Carolina had a good time. I hope you guys had good holidays. I hope you had a uh, good New Year's as well. I hope everybody's given up drinking uh, for the holidays because that'll be a little bit easier for myself to give up drinking as well. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, we have conditioning. So what does conditioning mean for an athlete? And if you're chunky, like Russell Bowman, does that mean that you need conditioning to lose weight? And I think that some of the first key things that we've got to realize, and if we look at today's uh, YouTube video, if you guys check that out, I think most of being chunky, Earl, is going to come back to uh, or Earl. Jesus, I just called Russell Earl. Come on, because <laughs> I was probably making fun of Earl earlier for being fat. Most of the issues around uh, being chunky is that you just got to dial in your nutrition. Uh, one thing for me personally, I'll gain like six pounds over two to three weeks because I'm training less. I'm not in as good of a routine. I'm not sleeping as well. I'm eating way more. Uh, and then the next two weeks, I'll probably lose five to seven pounds just by like getting back into that routine. So if we're talking about conditioning for athletes, I think the first big thing that you've got to look at is what's the specific pattern uh, of the actual sport that you're training for? So if you've got these athletes, what what is it that we're looking for as far as the athletes are concerned? Um, and then if we're looking at, you know, I'm actually thinking about Will Vertel just had a, a post where some people were super heated and I wanted to ask him a couple questions for clarity about it. Um, <clears throat> but you looking at like a sport like wrestling, right? So some people would say, and I believe Will was saying this, is that sports specific conditioning isn't effective. OK, so if I'm looking at wrestling and we understand that there's, you know, anywhere from five to twenty five second goes. And then there's a break. But while there's a break, there's still tension. Uh, there's still uh, a higher heart rate. But then there has to be another rapid go again. Part of conditioning is being capable of applying uh, a large amount or like if we looked at a max go. So a good example, if we're looking at actually this is a good example to use. If we're looking at a thousand meters, right, if we have a thousand meter assault bike test, and you go all out at a thousand meters, okay, and let's say you hit it in a minute 40 or a minute 30, something like that, right? To me, conditioning for somebody who would be on a bike or a swimmer or something like that would be, okay, can you do uh, five repeats or six repeats at like 85% of that test or 90% of that test? And the greater that you can get those repeats, the more volume that you can get those repeats at a higher percentage, the more conditioned you'll be. So a similar example to that, and this might sound crazy, but if you look at that thousand meter example, and then you put that 1000 meter example into the world of powerlifting, that example would be, okay, if we warm up and we work through an entire warm up in a powerlifting comp and we have to deadlift and we have to back squat and we have to bench press, can we work up to 100 to 105 if we want to hit PRs percent of our max? And can we handle that volume? Are we going to be conditioned enough to deal with that stress from that powerlifting specific test? Same thing if we're a shot putter. Okay, if you're a shot putter, the same exact example would be can you take two to five warm up throws and still throw six throws at that 
that very high 90 to 96, 98 percent of your best for six throws. That's conditioning. And so if we can be conditioned for our specific sport, that's that's the, what that model looks like for a sport like football. That example of the, the if we're using that 1000 meter repeat test example, that would be OK. Let's say that you can bench press 315. OK, you're a running back or something. If we can bench press 90 percent of 315 under fatigue, if we can back squat 85 to 90 percent of our best, if we can clean 85 to 90 percent of our best under fatigue, if we can run 85 to 90 percent of our best at 40 meter sprint or 40 yard sprint, if we can do all those things at a certain percentage, that means we're conditioned when shit's, you know, when we're in the, that real competitive environment. And so the big goal then is identifying that that 90 percent. It's identifying that 92 percent number. And so it's looking at the percentage of intensity and it's looking at the volume that of, of sets or of repeats. So for wrestling, those repeats might be like 15 goes because you have a higher amount of intervals for throwing that might only be eight to 10, you know, where you're going to do that. So the conditioning aspect is going to be very specific to the sport. Now, traditionally conditioning is going to be looked at more so in the sense of aerobic capacity. Um, how quickly can you recover uh, after your heart rate is at, you know, 165 to 180? How quickly can you get that down below 120? That's essentially the number where you're going to be recovered, where you're going to feel recovered and then get that back up. So I think that, that those are some, some key examples. Now, some of the misconceptions about endurance training is that a large amount of endurance training can – you know, lead to you be, being weak. It can lead to you getting smaller. It can lead to um, you getting slower. There's fiber shifting and things like that. And so that's where you've got to toe this fine line and figure out. And this is one thing that we've done with some of our wrestling guys that, that I work with is that I try to figure out a, a formula around, okay, if you're in season for wrestling, how many hours, if we have, let's say in a week, right? In a week of training, we've got 20 hours, okay? That's quite a bit. Let's, let's say that we're around 15 hours. So if we said out of 15 hours, 10 of them are on the mat or 12 of those hours will be on the mat. Well, how many of those 12 hours are going to be high intensity intervals? How many of those 12 hours are going to be slower, sl like slow distance uh, training and then how many of those hours are going to be something like um, you know resistance based training like strength training and so you've got to figure out that formula with endurance training like okay well we know that slow distance if we do too much of it can make us weaker can make us smaller if we're running 30 plus miles a week you're not going to be able to lift as much because you won't have the volume in the weight room to get stronger so you've got to find that happy medium can we get 10 miles a week and still be strong yeah, pretty much. Okay. Well, the next thing. All right. Well, if I got 10 miles a week in or 12 miles a week of running in, can I still do two 20 minute high intensity interval training and still stay strong? I believe you can. Yes, for sure. I think you still can. Can you do those two things and still lift three to four days a week? Yeah, I believe that you can do all that. You can improve that. And will the interval training and will the training of the slow distance help your lifting to a point? Yes, I believe it will. So if we're looking at a sport like wrestling, that's going to make sense. If we're looking at a sport like weightlifting, that interval or that the high intensity interval stuff, that doesn't really make as much sense because it doesn't really pay off as much uh, to your maximal strength. So you've got to look at those strength characteristics. So a lot of this comes back to identifying those three characteristics and then understanding that the common misconceptions from endurance training are typically from having like hardcore we're all in and we're running 30 40 miles a week instead of looking at it like look there's a big gray area when we're talking about endurance training we're not trying to train like kipchoge and become you know a world record holder <clears throat> or kipped him a world record holder in a marathon and we're not trying to train like a a power lifter who's going to have a world record in deadlift we want that to be somewhere in the middle where we have endurance we have explosiveness and we have strength and so we've got to find that happy medium area or that gray area for endurance and for strength training and for explosiveness. And so 
how can athletes of different sports train endurance? I think I, I sort of touched on this a bit, but the best way to to break this down then is like, okay, if in season, okay, so if you look at it and said, okay, how much endurance training is going to be done doing slow, slow distance stuff? And then what's the sports representation of slow distance? Okay, so slow distance, I go out, I run three miles at a 11 minute clip. That's slow distance. Okay. Now, if I was a wrestler, slow distance uh, representation would be doing flow wrestling like just real easy technical stuff but my heart rate's still around like a 140 beats per minute that's still going to be that sports representation for football we're going way high with our heart rate and dropping that heart rate back down so for football that endurance training is going to look a little bit different we won't do as much slow distance stuff that's going to be on the field most of the slow distance stuff that we would probably be doing is going to be with a sled or it's going to be on an assault bike potentially or in a sauna okay and then if we're looking at a sport like an 800 meter run well an 800 meter run they're going to try and get way more miles in to try and build this big base of uh, aerobic capacity to try and then increase their vo2 max to then lead to faster times so uh, it's it's really identifying the ratio of slow distance compared to high intensity interval compared to sprint interval and it's finding the representations of those three areas in the specific sport and then identifying the timeline the ratio timeline for each specific sport as you build out your program and then also factoring in resistance training plyometric work anything along those lines okay so that's like a real easy crash course on how different sports would then would then train that. <clears throat> Actually, when I answer this quick, because I did this workout today. Yeah, I do think 30 miles a week could remap slow twitch fibers. Uh, 30 miles slower, slower. Okay, so what about five to seven intervals at 1,000 meters with three minutes rest for endurance? I think that would be a very, if we're talking about on an assault bike, I think that would be um, a I believe that would be a huge impact on increasing your VO2 max. Uh, so that would be more like high intensity work uh, just to go over that quick. So how can someone program endurance for, for athletes? I think programming the endurance, uh, that stuff's going to come back to really laying out when, when we're looking at, okay, so if, if I'm programming this, what's the priority we have three strength characteristics. Okay, what are those priorities? Three strength characteristics. Okay, so if we look at that and then we come back and then we say, okay, where does endurance, where does sustained endurance, uh, where do those two fall in line on the strength characteristics? If we have a shot putter, they're almost going to have no endurance components outside of the specific sport endurance that they're, that they're doing, the throwing that they're actually doing. Okay, so if you have a thrower, that's going to be minimal. They don't really need endurance. They just need to lift more. They just need to throw a little bit more and they're going to gain that. They can still have a benefit from doing some lower, slow uh, endurance work or getting in the sauna. That's still going to have a positive impact on their recovery capability, but it's not that important in the grand scheme of things. Now, if we're looking at a wrestler, one of the wrestler's benefits or a boxer or a fighter is going to be sustained endurance. So can they sustain themselves at 90 to 95% of their aerobic max? OK, and that's the difference between an 800 meter runner and a marathoner is that the 800 meter runner will have a, a higher level of sustained endurance, but a lower level of classical endurance. A marathoner is going to be switched. OK, so it's figuring that out and then understanding what in training pushes classical endurance, what in training pushes sustained endurance, what in training pushes max velocity. And then you have these three umbrellas that you're building your programs around, and then that's how you shape your, your week of training. Uh, that's how I end up laying out all those, those, different, those different factors. Um, I think some of, the, some of the big stuff then is that I want to I wanna answer, I want to check out some of these reactions that we've got. I'm going to go into a reaction video here. I did want to ask you guys if you missed, if you... If you if you got all your your gifts for the holidays that you wanted to get, but I want to go into some of the reaction videos, and then we there is a paper. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. There we go. And then I also wanted to go into some of the. Um, there we go. I wanted to go into also some of the, um, 
we've got a paper, a research paper that I want to cover. So on the minute training, this is a great way here, uh, a great setup that I like to use with our football guys. Actually, yesterday we just had Peter Jones in here, the guy that he's going to Notre Dame, <clears throat> probably going to be a guard there. And we were doing on the minute or every 45 seconds power cleans for 12 sets. Okay, so 12 singles every 45 seconds. Then we did Hatfield squats, loaded up crazy Hatfield squats, uh, and he was only going on two minutes and 20 seconds rest. So it's like doing things like that can still build strength and lead to endurance. inside of the sport takes less than 20 seconds there's going to be a much higher degree of interval work and if we're talking about a sport like crossfit or football and the load that you're opposing is going to be greater than your body weight then there needs to be a decent amount of traditional resistance based training as well in other sports such as wrestling there's a lot of endurance work being done on the mat or inside of that competitive practice area. A lot of endurance might be triggered just by doing their sports skill. That's a big one right there. Is like if we're just doing our sports skill, in a lot of cases, we will improve our overall endurance, our conditioning. As I mentioned before, one of my favorite methods to increase uh, that. Ooh, this is a throwback. To have a great carryover. Uh, to specific sport play is going to be on the minute drills and this could be power snatch a power clean there's pete renda clean variation even all american uh, wrestler two-time olympian alex rose and you might do you know 10 doubles with hey, look at everybody so you want to go at like 65 to 70 percent of your best power clean over your best clean and do a single or a double over 10 to 15 minutes okay every single 45 seconds you hit that rep okay so that's a way that you can drastically increase your overall strength endurance and power endurance and that's one of the big factors here is that we have to and this is this is where a lot of strength coaches will say well you don't want to focus on on doing an extremely explosive movement with with minimal rest periods because it could in theory have a negative impact on your power output but if your sport is long duration periods of contact and muscular tension, you have to learn if you're in a 20 minute scrap in, in wrestling or a 20 minute period of, of fighting or you're a crossfitter and you, you, you have a session that might be an hour long, you have to have high power endurance. OK, and that's where this strength endurance stuff does come into play. So I think that's another that is a huge factor there is that a lot of people will in turn lead to like this. Uh, oh, well, you shouldn't do that because it can hinder your back squat or whatever. And it's like, dude, there's sports where doing on the minute work is essentially going to represent that work. And if we can replicate that a little bit in the gym and potentially increase their clean or their snatch or even a back squat to a point, like using Peter yesterday, he worked up to like a 130 power clean and he's in high school. And then we did like a 650 pound Hatfield squat for triples. And it's like, dude, with short rest, that stuff leads to huge, huge growth. And so if you guys comment and, and vote on the on the community post here on the YouTube uh, video, Bear Mode Dane, yeah, you guys can comment if you've ever used on the minute stuff. And on the minute work is where you're going to get into this sort of like flow state of training where you're just... You're lifting and you're recovering and you're lifting and you're recovering. And it's just going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until all of a sudden you just start to absolutely get into this crazy groove and you're, you're hitting PRs because everything becomes super, super repetitive. So I think it's, it's one of those big things that I recommend getting creative with your, your endurance work, getting unique and, and thinking through a little bit more dynamically, but then also looking at those strength characteristics for the sports that you're training or the individuals that you're training, breaking down those strength characteristics and then prioritizing them throughout the weeks, throughout the days of training within your week, and then basing that off of how you're going to peak. Like, dude, that's exactly, you know, that's how we lay out peak strength. That's how we lay out our own programming here. What That's exactly what we do is that when we are building this stuff out, we're thinking that that's the lens that we're building out and we're, we're working through. So, before we get into some more of your questions, I wanted to cover one more aspect here, the effect, and this is going to be a research paper where we're just going to look at uh, the effect of speed, 
the effect of speed, endurance, uh, and strength training on performance, running economy, and muscular adaptations in endurance trained runners. And so this is going to be, you know, people who are running cr- quite a bit more. So what they wanted to look at, look at here was investigate the effects of combined strength and endurance, uh, a speed endurance. Okay. With a reduced training volume on performance. Okay. Reduced training volume. Okay. So they're looking at running economy, muscular adaptations in 16 male endurance runners, and they have a pretty freaking good VO2 max there. Uh, that's, that's like a very solid VO2 max, uh, assigned to either a combined, uh, strength and <clears throat> speed endurance training. Okay. So it's speed endurance and lifting or st- yeah, speed endurance and, and lifting. Okay. So they're, they're starting to see what's going to happen. So for eight weeks, they replace their normal, moderate intensity training, 63 kilometers per week with uh, speed endurance two times per week and strength training two times per week, as well as aerobic high and moderate intensity training with a reduction in total volume. So about a 60% reduction, whereas the control group continued to, to roll with their, with their control. So they're, they're moving through that, right? And they look at, okay, in CSS, so when they're working through CSS, I'm just trying to read this quickly. Combined, combined strength and strength endurance and yo-yo intermittent recovery test performance. 400 meters and uh, yo-yo intermittent recovery test performance was improved by 5%. Okay, so by 5% and 19% respectively during the intervention period. Max aerobic speed was 0.6 kilometers higher. Okay. And maximal activity of lactate dehydrogenase subunits one and two was 17% higher after compared to before the intervention period. Time to exhaustion and peak blood lactate during an incremental uh, treadmill test was 9%, 9% and 32% higher in the uh, expression of NA+. Plus. I'm just trying to read through this. I mean, it was 15% higher after compared to before so 10k performance here maximum oxygen uptake and running economy were unchanged so they were the same no changes were observed in the control group all these guys did essentially was more sprint work more strength training work and uh more interval work and they saw an increase in 10k performance maximum oxygen uptake and running economy. Oh, no, no, sorry. Those things did not change. That they saw an intake or an improvement was they had a later time to exhaustion. They handled lactate better during training. They use it better as an energy source. Um, And their aerobic speed, their maximal aerobic speed improved. So adding strength training and speed endurance training along with a reduced training volume can improve short-term exercise capacity and induce muscular adaptations related to anaerobic capacity endurance trained runners. So what you can do with this is essentially if you're working with soccer players, okay, uh, maybe lacrosse players, field hockey players, you could use this as an example of saying, look, I know you guys want to go out and just go run 5Ks all the time. You want to go run 10Ks because that's what the research will show us is that uh, when, when you, you know, and so this is, okay, here's a, here's a good clip for soccer players. Okay. Soccer players, research will show that they run a 10, a 10 K during a game. They run a 10 K during the game that proves out in research. That's accurate. What soccer coaches then do is they see we run 10 kilometers in one game. Therefore we should run 10 kilometers for our training. However, what they end up ignoring is this specific study. Okay. So now they're not looking at this paper and they're not seeing this and saying, okay, so if we decrease our volume of running, but increase our speed endurance and increase our strength endurance, we'll handle and utilize lactate more effectively. And in turn, we'll have a higher aerobic speed and become better soccer players and actually have no change in our aerobic capacity. So that's how like we've got to think through this as as a strength training coach or as a performance coach, as sports performance coach, or as uh, anything along those lines is like when we see these these blanket statements for for papers or for specific sports we've got to look deeper at it instead of just saying soccer players run a lot so they shouldn't lift no based off of that based off of this this paper here okay 
Soccer players should lift a lot more. Soccer players should do more speed and speed endurance work and less mileage because that's going to lead to better performance. And there's still, you know, as a coach, there's still times in the year that you can sort of set that up and make it so that they still could get like baseline mileage, you know, four to eight weeks, 10 weeks in a year. And they'll, they'll be fine. They'll be okay. And still have that, that type of training. So I just wanted to, um, think about all of those things. Yeah. And Tyler Williams comment quality over quantity. I think that's a, that's a big factor. And I wanted to use this as, as an, my own example. And before we continue with the Q and a, if you guys are interested in these deeper dive, uh, discussions on all aspects, all these goals, consider, please consider becoming a channel member. Uh, it's 10 bucks a month where we go into a, a more in-depth dive around training, 10 bucks a month, uh, about an hour lecture every single week where we go into some more papers. We use these papers. We go in them into them uh, more in depth papers that we use in even in some of our YouTube videos to help educate you guys. So we meet every single Friday. All you guys got to do is <clears throat> click on the uh, click. If you're on the desktop, click the link in the description to become wait, click the join button. If you're on a desktop or click the link in the description to become a channel member today, that was a terrible plug for the, for the channel member, by the way, <laughs> terrible plug. Um, so Jens Bangsbo might be an interesting guy to get on the J it's, uh, and uh, Jacob Verup. I wonder where these guys are from. They've got to be from. I'm just looking at this paper right now. I, I think a, a lot of this stuff too. It's like when when we look at research and when we're looking at this. This is a paper from 2017, I think it was. It, it's just. I think it we make it a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Um, I think for my own thing, what I wanted to share before I get into your questions here, guys, is like if if I was, you know, when I trained for the marathon, my biggest concern was just running long hours, right? I was not concerned about my time. So my sole purpose was to stay healthy enough. Oh, by the way, here's my marathon. That's my marathon medal. <laughs> my sole purpose was literally to just be able to be comfortable running for a very long period of time. So I looked at it and I'm like, I if I want to do the marathon, I have to be able to run for three to five hours. I've got to be able to handle that. I don't care about my time. I don't care about how fast it is. I just want to go run. It's my first one. That's it. I just want to finish. So all I focused on was getting miles in. Okay. I worked up to like 56 miles, I think was the highest I got in one week. I've got to look at everything, but I'm pretty sure it was 56 miles was my peak. Um, the, the longest that I, that I ever ran, uh, was 21 and a half miles. Right. So it's like, okay, that was my goal, but my performance goal for that event was just finished just the duration now. Okay. So I'm thinking about doing the Stockholm marathon in June because Sam also will have a diamond league on June 2nd. June 1st is a marathon. June 2nd is his meet. So I actually might do this. Now, if I look to improve, okay, my time, if I want to run like a 430, I'm going to do more interval work. Twice a week, I'm going to do more interval work. And I might actually only run at the max like 30 miles a week. If I run 30 miles a week, but I'm doing interval work now that's going to increase my VO two max and my peak aerobic speed will be higher and I'll drop my time. So I'll actually decrease total volume of miles, but improve my, my, my speed. So that's like the introduction to playing the game of how to handle endurance work. Now, as you get to the more elite level, there's a lot more factors that you've got to weigh in, especially if you're working with, you know, uh, Beatrice Chabet just broke the world record in the 5K like two days ago, literally on New Year's Eve. She ran a 14, um, she ran a 14, 13, I think 5K. And it's like for her to run that, she has to do a ton of speed work. She has to stay healthy. She has to do a ton of VO2 max work. And it, it becomes a lot different of a game. But when we're talking about, you know, sports performance, it, it's not as complicated. So we just got to keep that in mind. So um, common posts, uh, community posts can continue. I'm currently training for my first 50K marathon. If you have any tips, frequent elevation gain throughout, currently running 10K 
50 to 60 minute range. That's good. Longest recent distance attempt so far was 21 miles in six hours, working up to nine hours time on my feet. I think that's where it's like once every 10 days, you just got to go long, long, long. You know, once every 10 days, you have a test. How long can I go? Can I go 21 miles? Can I go 25 miles? You know, 50 K. What is that? That's, that's like 31, 32 miles. I think if you could get to like 26 to 28 miles, I think you'd be fine. Can you try and explain on the minute for a football player a little better or more specific workout? So think about this for, um, Oh, fried rice boy. I bought the program design book. It's super good. Tons of information, but it doesn't really talk at all about how to progress weight and what rep schemes that is important. And we we're trying to cover that in the football book that we're going to release next year. Um, that we're already working on. I think the biggest thing with increasing weights, uh, reps and sets, stuff like that is that you've got to figure out like, okay, where am I actually like close to, and, and this is an update coming in peak strength is that I like to think about the, the reps in reserve. Okay. So it's like, okay, did I have one rep left? No, you didn't have one rep left in the tank, but you still got all those reps. Okay. Well then don't increase weight. Well, if you had one or two left in the tank, put like two and a half kilos on or put five kilos on the bar and try it again. And then that way you just sort of keep building a little bit more within a, within a specific rep scheme and, and set what a rep and set uh, scheme. I think that some of the big things, and maybe this is a good video that we could cover. So if you guys could comment on this, this, this is where we could understand. And I don't know what we would title this, but understanding different rep schemes and sets, like <clears throat> how to get stronger with the simplest rep scheme. I, I, you know, I'm trying to think through uh fried rice boys question here, because I think that knowing when to put weight on the bar is really, really important. And knowing when not to put weight on the bar is also really important because if I could look at it and say, a lot of people will do this, they'll put 10 extra pounds on the bar and fail a set and then terminate that entire workout. Okay. And so they don't do like three or four extra sets. Whereas there's situations here where we might see, okay, we get right on this fine line of failure. And instead of failing, we just stay there and we'll do three or four or five more sets at that weight. And that's where you get crazy, crazy strong because you're getting more volume by by holding that static position. And I think that that's something that a lot of people could learn. And that's what we're doing with our, our next update in peak strength is that we're changing the the weight regulator. Uh, and that's going to lead to some, some better performance. Um, yeah, Jason, I agree with you there. I think, so I think the, you know, what's funny with the IRIs, RIR stuff is that whenever I've trained guys in the gym here, I've always been able to see like, yeah, you could have like one or two reps in that. You could have no reps left or whatever that, that point is. And I think that then what we look at is like within the periodization model, you have to understand when is it more important to get those extra three to four sets versus when is it more important to push the load versus when is it important to do a drop, a drop set? And when is it important to do a drop set that's going to be speed focused? And then when is it important to do a drop set that's going to be hypertrophy focused? And those are all like real, real advanced level concepts in, in considerations that lead to this discussion of when we should be adding weight and, and not adding weight. And I think that there's got to be some way that we could cover this because there's so many different like reps and set schemes that we use in our programming that I, that no one else uses. And I actually, you know, I've been just tinkering around with this book, the science of running. It's from this guy, Steve Magnus. And some of the stuff in there is freaking phenomenal. But then you read his, some of his stuff on strength training. And it's like, dude, this guy has no clue, but he has no clue because he's just in the running world. And it vice versa. A lot of people never have, a clue on endurance. Like I didn't have that much of an idea on endurance outside of wrestling and football. So it's like, it's learning these advanced concepts, but then coming down and watering it down and thinking on that base level. When you have a kid who's in eighth grade that walks in the door, like how, how advanced do you have to get? You don't have to get that advanced, but then if they keep training with you for five, six years and you try to get them to the NFL, you got to get more advanced. So that's, that's some of those, those concepts there. Um, I want to explain the the benefits of i want to go over 
uh, on the minute lifts. Okay. So the on the minute lift. Okay. And I think that this is the most, this is one of like the simplest hacks that you can use in strength training, especially for power development, for impulse expression. If I'm trying to look at it as impulse, speed strength is really impulse. It's not speed strength. It's impulse. It's force over time. Okay. Force in a designated period of time. If I'm trying to improve that, okay, and I want to do something like a weightlifting movement, so a power snatch, power clean, a one box clean, a hang clean, a behind the neck jerk, a linebacker jerk, or even if I wanted to do like a fast trap bar deadlift or a pad bench, whatever it might be. If I did like one to two reps, okay, and the main goals were getting somebody in shape for consistent power output, for consistent impulse, what we what we can then do then is like let's say you start and you do so what we did yesterday 12 singles every 50 seconds 12 singles every 60 seconds okay this is peter jones okay hit the first clean drops it start the timer 60 seconds 60 seconds goes hits the second clean and what we did is we did three sets at the same weight okay Every single time, as soon as the bar drops, you start the timer, 60 seconds, and you stay on the platform the whole time. You're not moving from the platform. And what happens is in a big gym setting where you have three or four people on a platform, it's basically like boom, 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 everybody's resting, boom, 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 everybody rests, and everybody gets into this flow of just smashing weight. They're not being distracted. Okay, so the on the minute then, now you do that for 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes. I always tell this story. We have... DK Hoagland, okay, second team uh, preseason All-American D2 offensive lineman. Before he went into his season, this is like a week before his season started at Bloomsburg, he was cleaning 170 at the end of 15 minutes. And it's like, dude, that that's 375 pounds at the end of a quarter. That's a quarter. We were basing it off of a quarter of a football game. So now imagine if he's at the end of the half and he could do 165 kilos. If he's at the end of the third quarter, he's doing 160 kilos. Think about it through that lens. And now all of a sudden you're only diminishing like 5%, 6% of your max. And that's the whole goal is that the athletes in the third and fourth quarter that might only diminish two to 3% of their max are the ones that are going to be winning football games they're gonna be winning baseball games they're gonna be winning you know basketball games when everything is on the line because they can handle that fatigue and stress at a much higher level so that's that's some of the big aspects around on the minute work um i think we have up there complete guide to rep ranges i think that if you guys could go vote on that um i think this is a, a concept that it, it seems so simple on the on the outside and some of the the principles that we, you know, we used a lot of pyramid loading growing up. We, we used a lot of ratchet loading. We used a lot of waves. Okay. So those three things alone, like most people don't even know what they are. And even doing like something like a one, six method, you can use these little tricks to elicit this big response, but they have to be used at the right time in your periodization. They have to be used at the right time in your program. Because if you're trying to get a specific type of adaptation, it's gotta be planned at the right time. And so I think that that's some of those those concepts that we need to, to think about. Um, let's see here. How can we train for a sport which requires power output for prolonged periods of time at short intervals? Um, so I think that, I think that's where I would bring in those on the minutes. And I would also do, um, I would do, you know, I'm thinking about ice hockey. I would do athlete day type, you know, plyometric work with short rest. Um, if you have a cold, should you do a full peak strength workout or do two thirds? I would just say with a cold, I would, I would inform, um, I would always make things a little bit harder on the weight, on the weight tracker. So when you, when you, let's say you, you, that set was moderate, you just did a set and you, you felt it was moderate. I would inform the actual app that it was, that it was harder because what happens is, and this is what we do on site is basically that you don't want to increase your intensity when you're sick. You just want to get in and do some work and get out 45 minutes, 60 minutes and get out. That way your body is still adapting. It's still being stimulated. Okay. You're still trying to recover. I think when we do nothing now, there's certain times when you get so sick, you just need to do nothing, literally just do nothing and, and drink a whole bunch of bone broth, uh, go in the sauna, 
go outside for walks and that's it. There's times when that, but if you have a cold, it's like just diminish the intensity a little bit and you'll be able to recover. Um, Oh, nice. Thanks. JS. Boom. Thanks for that super chat. Have you ever read conjugate you by Nate Harvey? What is your opinion on the book? Um, JS, I have not. I'm almost 40 Haming. I'm almost 40. I turned 40 in March. Um, I have not read that book. Uh, why do I feel like I know who Nate Harvey is? Dude, sometimes I also realize I spend way more time reading other things than our actual industry of training. Uh, yeah, I don't know who Nate Harvey is. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't have an opinion. I, I could read it if you really recommend, if you think I would benefit from it. Um, okay. Peter O'Donnell with a B and with ab and cleans mostly. I'm not really sure what reverse pyramid, good or bad. So reverse pyramid is that sounds like, sounds like an Amway scheme. Is that going to be like you would go, let's say three, five, seven, nine, twelve, something like that. Is that is that what we're talking about with reverse period pyramid? Um let's see, East and Watt. What's the difference between push press and the jerk? So push press, you're just driving. Jerk, you're gonna drive and change direction. The jerk, you're gonna be able to use more weight. It's gonna be more athletic. It's really hard to get. Uh I, I think it it'd be fantastic to learn the change of direction. I think that's what actually I would be, the, I would say that's my big biggest criticism of power lifters is that when they start to learn a weightlifting exercise, or even when they're learning, like changing your level on the, on a wrestling mat, they really struggle. They, they move very rigidly. Whereas if somebody has, has a weightlifting background and throw and they come out and they throw, or if somebody has a weightlifting background and they get on the mat to wrestle, they can change their level, their hip level very rapidly. And it, it, it's smooth. It's, it's very, um, natural for them. And so I think that that would be, you know, the example of a push press is an easier drive. Um, now push press is a fantastic freaking movement. So is a power jerk. So, or split jerk. So that it all matters. Um, okay. So maybe I, I do know who Nate Harvey is. I've just never read his book. I would never allow my kids are older than yours and can be going into juniors. Okay, cool. Hey mate, what, what do you think of Pavel method for building endurance? Dude, I haven't read stuff from Pavel. Um, I haven't read Pavel's stuff in a long time. I'd have to brush up on that. Um, okay. So Nate Harvey, I think I do know who Nate Harvey is when he was at Buffalo. I think I did see, I think I might've watched the interview with, with him and Dave Tate, if I remember correctly. Uh, after you ran the mar marathon, you looked like you were 32. I don't know about that. I feel like I'm 90. Um, let's see. Reverse pyramid. Oh, one rep is 20K. Next set, two reps uh, for 15. Wait. One rep equals 20 kilograms. Next set is two reps, 15. Next set is three reps, 10 reps. Keese, I, I don't think you're – I'm a little unclear on this, Keese. How would you program for someone who is not an athlete and just wants general athleticism? How would you balance strength, power, speed? Ooh, Tyler. Ooh, nice. Thanks for that super chat. 999. How often would you would should athletes use deep massage recovery? Uh, are there optimal times to do so? Should you base should you base it off of when you get those nagging issues? So this is what I would say. Deep tissue massage from a practitioner versus deep tissue massage with tools. Okay. So if I'm using like uh, a weighted roller or like one of those smash rollers or a, a heavy pin, or if I'm using, um, I don't even Graston, something like that. Right. I think you can do those four to five days a week and you'll be okay. And I think that you should use them on areas that you're more prone to have issues with. And then do that for three, like, let's say you did that for three months and then you see how you're feeling. And then once every week or two weeks, you go to a therapist, you go to a massage therapist, let's say every two weeks or every three weeks, whatever you can afford. Right. Let's say every three weeks you, you would go. Then when you go and you talk to them, Hey, I just have been working on these areas. What do you think? What do you think I should do? See if they notice anything. Some really, really good sports, uh, therapist masseuses or a masseuse will be able to tell the difference between a right side or a left side, depending if you work on them or not. Like they're going to be able to see like, yeah, I can tell you've been working on this, but this you have been neglecting. And then you can sort of ask them like, 
well, what do you think? Now, the other thing is I know with Tyler, you know, he's a world-class hammer thrower. Okay, so where did Tyler's question go? Yeah, there it is. So with Tyler, dude's thrown 74-plus meters, I think almost 75 last year, right, Tyler? Uh, 74, 80 or something like that. Did you throw 75? I can't even remember now. Jesus, I know you've thrown 76 in training. I'm trying to think if you hit 76 last year. Uh, now I'm just trying to go through Tyler's season last year. Now someone like Tyler, as a hammer thrower, I I would assume he can get upper back issues. I would assume lower left side, probably maybe some knee issues as well, hip issues from where he's sitting in the throw. Um, and it, I would be interested to see, I would assume more so the left side than the right side for Tyler. And that's where some very specific mobility work, um, very specific strength work to the opposing side. One thing I'll bring up is when Sam gets tested often, he, he almost always rotates like 10 degrees less to his right side than to his left side, because he's rotating so much in that favorable direction that that can lead to problems so you've got to figure out when we're talking about structural integrity and you know we we talk about this with with bodybuilding movements and with structural bodybuilding exercises you've got to look at it like all right what am i more prone to as an individual you know what are my my problems that i have okay that can lead to long-term chronic injury or long-term you know chronic use and then what does my sport what kind of injuries is my sport creating for me and it's a weird way to look at it but like a sport like weightlifting you are creating chronic use for your shoulders and your knees and your back so we've got to create structural bodybuilding and mobility work and recovery work based off of this and it all comes back to specific ratios that you got to figure out Okay, and this is actually ironically with Tyler's question, if we're looking at this could be a whole YouTube video on itself, is that if we looked at specifically, right, what am I prone to as an athlete genetically? Okay, what am I prone to from my sport? What am I prone to from my past history as an athlete? That's how we have to build out your your recovery, your bodybuilding, your mobility. And any type of specific work. And then you have to educate your masseuse or your therapist on those those things. So to answer your question, Tyler, I would say two to three weeks. But then you've got to have those those nagging issues that you have. You've got to have like a, a consistent routine of three to four days that you cycle through. Like every three days, you're doing the same the same targeted aspect. Let me know if that makes sense. Is road work for combat sports overrated? It depends on the intensity of the of the road work. I don't think it, I don't think it is as long as they're staying healthy in their knees and their ankles. Can I do plyos and sprinting three times a week since I'm decent, decently slow, strong but slow as frick? Um, I think you can. I would do short sprints twice a week, maybe a little longer sprints once a week, and just be aware that that can beat you up. And I would do plyos more more contrast methods, uh, in your training. Um, okay, so. He recommends going barely to the point where lactic acid starts to build up and then cooling off to not trash the muscle. What do you think about Pavel's? Uh, that's interesting. I I don't necessarily think that's accurate, though. I think that from my understanding of higher intensity work to get, um, yeah, snatching over 100 kilos at 40 is great. I think when we're looking at lactic work, like I think you should get into that lactic zone and get your body to, accustomed to dealing with it and, and utilizing it as an energy source and so that that's where i think like if we're looking at endurance work as a percentage like let's say there's a hundred percent if you just took a hundred percent of my endurance work um i think to to just try to finish and run a marathon you just do like 90 to 100 percent of it at slow steady pace because you need to just finish it if we're trying to look at it from a performance perspective i would go like 70 percent of it long slow you know zone two type work 30% zone four, zone five work. And that's how you start to think through like the total percentage. Then you look in even deeper and you go, okay, I've got this percentage here. How can I break this down based off sport representations of those zones? Okay. I hope that helps. Um, 
Is hypnotism for increasing performance a real thing for elite athletes? Adam Nelson did that in 04. I would assume it worked. I, I don't know for sure. How do you program bodyweight exercises only using the uh, parabolic periodization system? The biggest aspect here for, for calisthenics, okay, is looking at something like, let's just use a walking lunge, okay? So a walking lunge can be challenging, but what's harder than a walking lunge? A skater squat. Well, what's harder than a skater squat? Depending upon your ankle mobility, probably a pistol squat. So what I would like to do then, and then we go, what's even harder? Well, a skater, a skater jump. So then you would go, okay, what days am I just going to do body weight, you know, let's just say body weight squats, walking lunges. And then what days am I going to do jump lunges, squat and jumps, tuck jumps, pistol squats, pistol squats, jump to a box. Now that's how I sort of break it up. Uh, using that um i did the men's okay so kyle's asking i'm two months out from an international game i'm following the 80 20 per, uh, conditioning interval to increase overall conditioning how can, where can i add um plyos to increase speed and agility i would you know what's the game for kyle what's the sport that you uh are are training for yes i do i do calisthenics um fried rice rice boy Typically split jerks. We still do push press quite a bit. Sam's push press, I think 200 kilos, but split jerks are priority. Um, I need to know, Kyle, the type of sport that you're training for. Um, let me know about that. How can you get strong tendons? Strong tendons is you know, making sure that you're doing uh, good volume work, making sure that you're doing slow eccentric work here and there, making sure that you're actually resistance-based training to increase that. For rugby, I would be careful there. I, I don't think like I would just be very concerned because in rugby, like the faster you are, the more it's going to pay off. I would want to know how many hours or how many minutes a week are you doing endurance based work? Um, so. I would just say I that's what I would want to know, you know, if you're only doing like 60 to 120 minutes a week. I think you should do more speed stuff. And what I would do is like I'd have an endurance day. I'd have a sprint interval day. I'd have a speed day. You know, or I'd have that athlete day. Um, and that would help break things down quite a bit. Um, yeah. What do you guys want to see? What do you, what do you guys want to see? Have we done a reaction video of Warner Gunther's training? And I want to just bring this up. This is one thing. If there's one thing that pisses me off is that, the Werner Gunther training videos, dude, there's people commenting on these videos with zero context. I want to share this story in high school, Paul Ferency, world champion Highland games athlete gave me two VHS cassettes. He's like, they're in French, find a French teacher, get them translated. It was the Werner Gunther videos, Werner Gunther's videos. I took them to a French teacher, got them translated. And I, found there used to be a website called can throws it was canadian throws they had the whole program online that was based off of that video and i did that the whole summer leading into my freshman year at penn state and it's like dude that's like one of my i have such a connection to that that video the whole video how they peaked him how they built him out over 12 to 16 weeks how they built everything up into it um so, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you guys because sometimes I watch these videos and everybody's just, yeah, it just sort of pisses me off. Yeah, I think five hours a week is too much endurance for, for rugby. If you ask me, five, five hours a week is a lot for, for rugby. Um, I want to know, too, for, for you guys, if there's anything, you know, that we could offer, what do, you th what do you think that maybe that peak strength lacks or that we need to provide in the, in the performance space, in the sports performance space that you would want in your own training? Let us know. Comment in here because those, those are a lot of ideas. Even the topics on, on uh, reps, sets, uh, the endurance discussion, that's a lot of stuff. And, and I will say this is that um, the NSCA, the NSCA has hired me to – be their keynote speaker this summer in July, uh, with their on, on the the topic of endurance work, and so I think it's something that I think there is a little bit of a hole. There's a little bit of, of room that we could make up ground uh, and that we could improve upon, and also that a lot of strength coaches, like myself included, dude, yeah, you know, I bench 500 pounds. I I what jerk 212. I, I deadlifted 705. I snatched 145. And I always was very afraid of, of endurance work. 
Uh, and I think that sometimes we we could make up ground there. I do want to do an ultimate frisbee, an ultimate uh, video there. I think that would that would pay off. Hybrid athlete style for peak strength. We have that with athletic fitness, but we've got to improve that, Aaron. Uh, so I think that that's fair. Um, I thought the number one thing that pisses you off is yeah, Mason not using the whole circle. That's hilarious. Ah, uh, that's funny. Okay, so Samuel's got a good question here. What I would do is I would do speed and agility, and then I would do an impulse session. Okay, so if we do impulse for us is day four. That's how that's how I would set that up. Um, so if I have somebody who needs more explosiveness versus more strength, it's still going to be pretty similar. Oftentimes what I've found is like somebody who just is really, really strong – they, you know, you put them on a PVC pipe or you make them jump rope or, or you, you have them do skips for like five weeks every day. And all of a sudden they like figure out how to be athletic, but they just don't do it enough. You don't do, you know, go outside. I can go out and skip backwards or skip forwards. And it's pretty easy. Guys that are very, very, very strong have lost that, the, that reflex of skipping. Okay, of doing things that are a little bit more athletic. So the fastest way for them to get it is to go skip for height, skip for distance, skip backwards. Do, you know, single leg jump rope, double leg jump rope, jump, you know, doubles on the jump rope, little short uh, box jumps, jump up, land on one leg, jump down, land in the other, and just do little things like that literally every single day to improve their, their twitchiness. And then all of a sudden around five or six weeks, it's like, oh, shit, I have it. But they've, they've, they've just lost it a little bit because they've been lifting so heavy for so long and they're not thinking about like big time speed. So it's just, it's figuring out how to recruit at a very, very high speed and it just takes some time. Um, I'm just looking at what Kyle's saying here. I, yeah, I know, but six hours, six hours of or five hours a week of cardio is so high. Um, it's so high. And yeah, so Jason just commented in there, the aerobic system opens up a lot of new gains. I think that's another big aspect. If you guys remember, I don't know if you remember the video that there's pa there's a paper on, um, it's like 15 to 20 minutes of endurance work followed by like leg press or leg extensions. And it's like literally just adding in 15 minutes of endurance work a day can increase your muscle size and strength. And it's easy. It's easy to do. So Keep that in mind. Um, trying to, I, th I think a lot of this stuff is that we forget about is just actual volume. And I think a lot of us don't want to do the actual volume because it's freaking hard. So, um, yeah. Kyle, I'm going to think about this, though. I'm going to think about your rugby question because that's a, that's a tough one. I think five hours is an absurd amount of, of time for aerobic work, you know, versus your speed work. Uh, and when are you doing your speed work? Are you running sled? Are you doing sled work? Things like that. I, I would just be interested in that. And like, I would even want to know, like, what can you single leg squat? Like, genuine, like, can you do a Nordic curl? Like, I would want to know those things. Best balance and coordination exercises. What are the best balance and coordination exercises. You know, this goes back to, dude, go, go do a, actually, I'll, I'll share this story. Um, so Christian Thibodeau is a, a, a decent friend. Uh, we talk online sometimes and uh, he just messaged me and he's like, yo, I, I just wanted to, to let you know, like I, I got I'm back into like doing some weightlifting stuff just for fun. And I told him that I, it takes me like 10 to 12 minutes to do a snatch. And it's funny because when I told him this, I, I thought through it. And it's like if we're looking at balance and coordination, one of the reasons why as I'm older, I'm 40 now when I do a snatch. It's like warming up. First of all, it's like a little bit of a mobility issue. I got to wake up all my muscles and really get into good positions. But the speed and the balance required to do it and then the thought process from my giant head that I have to think through is also a challenge. And it's like if we're looking at speed and balance and coordination, like, dude, just do a snatch. It, and everybody's like, oh, I don't want to do that. Well, you don't want to do it because it's hard. But if we're thinking about balance and coordination, 
learn how to do it. It's like a new skill. Like I think we should learn new skills every single year. And, and that should be like your new year's resolution is like this year's new skill. I just want to learn how to snatch and see what happens. And if I can snatch close to my body weight in a year or two years, I'll probably be, I'll probably have more balance and coordination. I'm not saying everybody uh, should do that, but I think that, I think that, that, you know, that, that does come into play. So I don't know if Kyle's making fun of me or, or himself there. Um, but yeah, I was just, I wanted to share that balance and coordination with that story. I think Christian had said like he, he, you know, I, for me, it takes me 10 to 15 minutes to warm up. And he's like, I think for me, it takes 30 minutes, you know, jokingly, but he was just having fun getting back into it because of the challenge of the coordination, because of the challenge of the speed. Um, so, all right, I'm going to head down to coach. I am going to head out. Thanks for all these great questions. Thanks for participating in these these surveys. Head over to peakshrink.app, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store. Until next time, peace.